Hello, everybody. Hello. How's everybody doing out there in Zoom Landia? Let me know how you're doing in the chat, or you can come off mute. Let me know how you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> hi y'all hi welcome doing okay for sunday evening i hear that it's been raining all day here in new york so it's giving nappy it's giving nap time <laughs> but uh, welcome so much to everyone who's coming into the Zoom. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm so excited to have the author of this book here with us. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the Free Black Women's Library Reading Club. We meet on the last Sunday of every month over Zoom at 7 p.m. And we read books by Black women specifically uh, we read fiction we read nonfiction, we read essay collections we read poetry we read stories um, everything and usually if it's a newer book a more contemporary author Houston's in the house period um, I like to reach out to that author and just say hey we're gonna talk about your book will you please come and talk to us and I'm so grateful uh, that when I reached out to LaVon, uh, she said, yes, I got an enthusiastic yes. So really good, really awesome. Um, so yeah, um, please feel free to stay tuned for our book for October and come back again and talk to us some more. And yeah, definitely put in the chat. I'm so glad she said yes too. I got my book right here. Um, and if you have uh, any suggestions on books that you've read recently that you feel like oh I think every black woman black femme black girl should read this book like if you read something like that recently and you want to put it on the list of books that you think we should talk about please send me the title because I'm always looking for like new engaging provocative works so Yes. Um, Quasi. Am I saying your name right? Quasi said she just read it. Um, let me drop a comment in the chat and let me know who's read, who has read the book so far. Or if you haven't <laughs> read it. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I'm going to read the descriptor. Um, Central Faith, The Art of Coming Home to Your Body. Okay, awesome. Forward by Brianna Boyd, PhD. Oh, we have somebody coming in. Okay. So home is not an address. Home is where you feel safe and your body is aching to be your home. This book is an invitation for women to discover a healthier approach to spirituality and sexuality that centers pleasure rather than shame. In Central Faith, LeVon Brigg charts a path for us to practice spiritual wellness that aligns and harmonizes our bodies with pleasure and sexuality. Centering the rich traditions of ancient West African spirituality this book offers a radically inclusive model of companioning oneself, filled with wellness rituals, journal prompts, affirmations, and practices. Central faith shows us how to celebrate our bodies as our very homes. Pleasure is your birthright, writes Briggs. So whether it's accepting your flesh, nurturing your intuition, learning the language of consent, 
or indulging in sumptuous self-care. Let radical self-hospitality guide you to healthy sexuality. Mm, so good. Um, so yeah, everyone, join me in welcoming um, the writer of this incredible book, LaVon Briggs, to the Zoom stage. <laughs> hey. Hey. Hi, Boo. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing marvelous. I just got to say, I'm a Queens girl for those who don't know. Okay. So the moment you open your mouth, I was like, oh, baby, <laughs> it's giving Brooklyn Queens Expressway. It's giving <laughs> 495 LIE. Okay. <laughs> Very much so. Very much so. Yeah. Through and through New York City. Okay. New York City, girl. <laughs> Concrete okay. jungle where dreams are made of. There's nothing you can't do. <laughs> That's a fact. That's okay. a fact. Where are you based? So I'm based in DC now. The DMV got me, child. I was okay. like, oh, Chocolate City. But it's cute. I know why Spirit has me here. Um, if anybody's from the DMV, I love how Black the the area is but i don't care for how pretentious it is you know what i'm saying in new york everybody's fly we don't gotta be like oh what you do to make you fly you just be fly so that part of it really throws me off but there's something really cool about being near like the embassies and stuff because mm. my mom was born on barbados my dad was born um in guyana ancestrally on my mom's side we're from sierra leone and on my dad's side we're from angola so i've been able to go to all these embassies and just be like hey i belong to you oh, wow. <laughs> what, what do i need to do to get my citizenship that has been very very cool but um, yes 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 so are um, you from where did you grow up in new york yeah i did i was born in midtown manhattan child back and forth between queens and manhattan since i was a kid i um uh, went to ps80 in rochdale village um i went to uh wagner junior high school upper east side got sent to boarding school in jersey <laughs> and then mm. came to nyu for a year yeah somebody was like oh the, the emmy so i actually won this emmy in 2008 for the um beijing olympic games that year so i was a producer uh, wow. so the Emmy. now i just need my grammy my oscar my tony period will be complete <laughs> yo if there's one thing that a black woman's gonna black woman at it's <laughs> being a multi-hyphenate and doing multiple <laughs> things like yeah I'm a poet i'm a writer i'm a reverend i'm a seamstress i'm a tv yeah producer. I'm a chef. Like mm -hmm. it was when I was a student at Yale Divinity School that I had to figure out what my three descriptors were. I feel like that's very branding in the 21st century, right? Three where so I was like preacher, poet, educator, like mm -hmm. all those things. So now what do what do I identify as, child? Levon, I'm here. <laughs> I mean, I show up in the world as a healer. Um I've pastored, uh, I don't identify as a pastor, but people still consider me their pastor to this day. Um, an author, obviously, that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. um, but I really just feel like I'm a creator. Um, in my head, I'm a rapper. You know, people tell me I look like Issa Rae all the time. So if you watch Insecure and how she be rapping in the mirror, that'd be me, okay? <laughs> um, and I'm just really excited about being in community with Black women and femmes who are deeply committed to our liberation. Um, because you being here on a low key, hazy, lo fi, ramen, pho kind of night, right, shows that you're deeply committed to your individual liberation. And I believe that's how we're going to get to the collective liberation is through our individual liberation. So, yeah. yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I mean, like, one of the things I wanted to ask you, which you kind of touched on it already, is like, how did you? How did you land in this position of even writing this book? Because Ooh. it was really different. Like I read a lot, you know, yeah. I read a lot. And this you book, know, <laughs> this book is different from any book I've ever read. So I'm just mm. curious that, like, how did it come together? Like, mm. thank you for that. I received that. So um, I am first generation Caribbean American, the eldest daughter. Shout out to all my immigrant children, <laughs> especially the eldest daughters 
regulate your nervous system and we are entitled to financial compensation. Um, but growing up in the church, Episcopalian, white Jesus, I served at the altar. So I always had this really great respect for ritual and like candles and incense and all the things, right? Um, yes, I'm actually getting my Sierra Leonean citizenship. Someone put in the comments. Uh, so yeah, growing up with that sense of like religion was always there. Um, and as a Caribbean immigrant child, <laughs> school was my job. So I focused on education. And when I was in third grade, my teacher, Mrs. Zimmerman, gave us this writing assignment about short stories. And I wrote this story about this um, this bird, this raven, right? This is before I even knew who Edgar Allan Poe was. <laughs> and so when I read it out loud to the class, she was like, LaVon, you could be a writer when you grow up. And I was like, okay, lady, I don't know what you're talking about. I just saw this bird and I wrote it because you told me to, you know? Um, but as I was growing up and gathering experiences, you know, I realized that I was experiencing childhood trauma at home that um, wasn't being talked about or addressed in the church, but was absolutely having an effect, an impact on my life. And so when I was 19 years old, I'm sitting in this Episcopal church and we're having revival, which for Episcopalians, um, for the uninitiated, Episcopalianism is like Catholicism, except the priests can get married and stuff. So, um, you know, for them, it's like their little fish tambourines or whatever. And at one point in time, I felt like this cloak, this presence around me. Like if you've ever felt like just a warmth around you, it's like a very cosmic, like sacred sensation. And so I started crying, which is unheard of in that denomination. It's very stoic, very sit, stand, kneel, very proper. And my, my, my mom dragged me out of the church and she was like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. I just want to go back inside. So it was at that moment, I knew that me feeling God was a thing and that there was more to it than just like the agenda or the itinerary or the program that I had. I, I knew there was something bigger. So I started seeking different things, ended up in a Pentecostal church where you know, people talk about how you be rolling around swinging from the chandelier. And it was like, I could bring my body to the worship space. But the moment I started talking about my childhood trauma or anything else related to my body, whether it was my, my uh, cycle or, you know, cramping or, um, you know, breasts, whatever, like, oh, we don't talk about that here. And I was like, well, where do we talk about it? You know what I'm saying? Right. So finally, I ended up um, having questions about like the Bible and my faith. And I went to Yale Divinity School and I fell in with Baptists because they were social justice oriented and, you know, they would smoke cigarettes and listen to R&B. And I was like, we live in R&B? Okay, sign me up, right? <laughs> and all of the Episcopacostalness in me was simply how spirituality showed up in my life be because of who I was born to. But because I am a child of the continent, because I'm a daughter of the church and the diaspora, there was a, a syncretism, right? A coming together, a blending of everything that felt good to me. So I'll close this part by saying that the book is a composite of stories from my life and the lives of others, <laughs> because so many people have told me that they see themselves in this text. And it was based on my religious upbringing and my religious emancipation. So the colonized religion of my girlhood is not the liberated faith of my womanhood. And I wanted to invite Black women and femmes to be centered on their own spiritual expansion journeys. Mm. Yes. So thanks for staying with me through that, y'all. <laughs> no, we're here with you. Like, we're okay. here, like, where do you want to go? Let's go. Okay, cute, um, cute, cute, cute. Yeah, and I, and I feel like a lot of, I, I can't, I, even though we may not all be able to relate to the, the path that brought you here, there's so much that you shared within the book that definitely resonates. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just like the wanting to have discussions about your body and being mm -hmm. like shut down and uh, wanting to have discussions about your trauma and being shut down, like this whole idea of like, oh, if we don't talk about it, that means it doesn't exist. Like that weird type of, I guess they, it's considered cognitive dissonance or something mm -hmm. where it's or, like, go ahead, I cut you off. Oh no, it's okay. It's like um, it's like a lack of acknowledging it all of a sudden makes it kind of like go away, mm -hmm. um, and that's not the case. No. Um, <laughs> and you know, to to the folks that are here, 
um, definitely, I have my own uh, questions, but I'm not the only person that is, uh, will be asking questions in this conversation. Like if folks have questions, you can leave them in the chat or you can come off mic. This is a discussion about this incredible book. Um, and the other thing I want to ask is like, okay, so now that you've written the book and it's been out, um, how has the, how, how does it feel to have it out in the world mm -hmm. and how has the response been, um, have you encountered any strong feedback from the church, from family members, from, um, the people who, um, witness you go through this spiritual um, journey? Like, what has that been like? Yeah. You know, I, um, <laughs> want to read this part from the author's note yes. because I feel like this is going to work especially for a lot of people who are familiar with New York City so the author's note is page x4 xvi which is 16 anyway um let's see first paragraph my mom and I used to take the subway from our black middle class Queens neighborhood uh Jamaica New York behind the conduit if y'all farmers boulevard over there Queens neighborhood to the swanky white Upper East Side of Manhattan, where she worked and I attended preschool. One morning, I felt particularly rambunctious and was asking my darling mother a slew of questions. All the while, agitated subway riders in their varying pre-caffeinated states would have much preferred that this cute but supremely chatty four-year-old would hush up. Mommy, this is her favorite part of the story, by the way, ignored the evil glares of those F train onlookers and lovingly nudged me. What else? What else is an affirmation of the body, an invitation of the mind, and a celebration of the spirit? It beckons the speaker to go deeper because the hearer is truly listening. Like my mom, I am asking what else to this day. So I'm always asking what else, right? I identify as nosy, you know, when I'm in certain spaces, I'll say curious. Uh, but I have always had this gift of talking about hard things, things that society would say is taboo. I'm like, it's, there's no such thing as a taboo topic to me. And you'll notice throughout the book that every chapter has some, I say inquisitive, that's hilarious for me. Um, uh, the things that I talked about that I have overcome, you would be like, okay, one of these things is a lot. <laughs> All of these things is too much. But in my spiritual system, I believe that I agreed to this life journey before mm. I even oh, broke wow. the time and space continuum, right? African cosmology teaches me that. And so once I realized that Christianity was an ancient African religion that got co-opted and whitewashed, I was like, okay, let's go back to what my ancestors believed before the colonizers brought their white Jesus. And let's go back to the origins of Christianity where a North African Jewish refugee loved niggas so much, right? That he was like, yo, y'all systems are fucked up. Like get it together. That's the LeVon Briggs version. So for me, it's been super helpful to decolonize my Christianity, to embrace my African traditional spiritual base and practices, to heal my childhood trauma and all the bodily trauma throughout my lifetime and learn how to love myself unapologetically. So as you can imagine, okay, this is not a message that Bishop Marcus Johnson of International Kojic Sunrise Bedrock Baptist Church, right? wants black women hair. 85% <laughs> of the black church is black women. Black church leadership oh, wow. is not 85% black women. So you have patriarchal, sexist, misogynistic, misogynoirs, homophobic, queerphobic, transphobic, uh, sometimes fatphobic, sometimes um, um, ableist, right? Sometimes ageist messaging being spewed from these pulpits and that's what you're being raised to believe is that your body is sinful and you are evil and there's nothing good about you. Like, like hold up, wait a minute. Aren't we talking about God is good? Well, if I'm an expression right. of God, ain't I good? I don't understand, right? And so this message goes against so much of colonized Christianity, which is mainstream, westernized, uh, nationalist, white <laughs> Christianity that so many of um, us are uh, have had exposure to, even if we've never stepped into a, a black uh, a church. And the the, la the two 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 more things I'll say: the black church specifically is where I come from because that's where 
my social location is, but be very clear that there are black churches that are espousing white rhetoric, <laughs> right? That is right. very, and then even if you aren't Christian, let's say you grew up in an Ile or you grew up non-religious or whatever, there are certain puritanical ideals from the colonized West that have seeped into society, right? And like affect us just going to school, going to work, going to get gas, whatever. So while uh, we <laughs> love this book and the, the, the book, you know, I wrote for a former version of myself um, is meant for us. And I love every time it lands into a black woman or femme's hands um, and sometimes black men and non-gender conforming folks, it's written for you. <laughs> like when you read it, you can be like, I start by saying, hey, boo. Bitch, if you don't know this book is for you, <laughs> this is for us. And so for us, we love it. We stand it. It um, opens up our mind to think about spirituality. It um, forces us to face and name things that has happened to ourselves. And it just beckons us to create a system of belief around God and our spirituality that doesn't tolerate us or bullshit us, but centers us and celebrates us and affirms us. So for us, we love it. For the systems, they mad. I don't right. care. <laughs> right. Right. Period. Period. And I really love when you talk about decolonizing Christianity in the book. Mm -hmm. I like that you brought that up again. Um, Cause I think it's such an important point. Um, and it just makes me think of like, you know, that's this idea of like um, church hurt. Mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the oftentimes I've, you know, been in conversation with a lot of black folks, especially black queer folks and black queer women mm -hmm. um, or black women who aren't interested in being married or being in a heteronormative relationship. Hello. And, <laughs> and I feel like there's um, oftentimes might be this kind of like conflict, this inner conflict that takes place within them because they seek to be a part of a black church because they want that community. But or there's also that, um, that pressure that uh, slight uh, feeling of maybe I don't really I'm not really 100% sure this is for me yeah totally you know so I'm just curious like what was that process like of that decolonizing like sure. was it something that felt emotionally uh, struggled like was it emotional struggle was it like liberating like how did you how did you even start that process? I love this question. And you just said the magic word, right? Liberate. So I talk about this in the book. Um, Dr. Crystal Jones is a healer and a psychotherapist. And she does work around like the altar, meaning yourself. You are the altar to be altered. And we were having tea in Atlanta once at uh, just at Honey. If you're in or near Atlanta, love that place. John Wesley Dobbs uh, over there. <laughs> Anywho, she was like, your, your cells hear everything you say, right? Talking about the language that we use and how our cellular makeup holds DNA that for many black women and fans, let's be honest, we carry trauma, right? Whether it's individual, collective, intergenerational, we're also healing that. So we could be saying decolonize your faith, decolonize your spirituality, but saying decolonize still centers colonizers and colonization. She's like, or you could say liberate. And she's like, you're saying the same thing. You're just putting an emphasis on what you want to see and mm -hmm. not what you're resisting or fighting or struggling against, right? And so that really changed a lot for me. I still say the term decolonize just as a point of reference because when I say it, people know what I mean. They may not automatically get what I say when I say liberate Christianity. So I'll say decolonize slash liberate Christianity, right? But it could be Islam. It could be... Judaism, it could, whatever your thing is, your uh, background. So it started when I was at that revival and I started crying in church because I had never seen anyone cry in church. So I was like, I got something going on. These niggas don't like, I don't know. <laughs> I want to cry. I feel like tears are coming. I want to let them fall. I'm not, I wasn't embarrassed by it. I felt moved. I actually felt like I was the only one in that sanctuary, to be honest. And so I, the thought that I had was there's got to be more to it than this. And that's who I started to really talk to on my platform is black women and femmes 
currently or formerly church who have had that thought, there's got to be more to it than this. There's got to be more to it than talking about, oh, Eve ate the apple and caused the fall of humanity. And now we have childbearing pains. Like there's got to be more than this. He's talking about gay people going to hell. Like, I don't believe that. I apologize that that is activating language for anyone. That is not true. But like- But they really do keep it that simple and basic. And it's like, no, I'm like, honestly, they people love me real good, like more than y'all. So what, what are we really saying here? Right. So also this unctioning, this feeling of like, there's got to be more to it than this is what ultimately led me to a Pentecostal church that seemed to have all the answers, right? The Bible says this, God said this, Jesus said this, da, da, da. And I was like, okay, let's just presuppose that this is true. Who wrote this? Where did it come from? They were like, well, the Bible, I was like, no, 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 no. I know what the Bible says, but what is it saying? Okay, that's what I need to know. So I actually have chapter four um, where I break down all of the biblical stuff that just we were mired in around sex and sexuality and our bodies and all that kind of stuff. So it's called, what's chapter four called, child? Um, what but the, the Bible says, says. Acknowledging what church and society got wrong. <laughs> Jesus said nothing about gay people. Absolutely. Jesus said nothing about hell. Jesus said nothing about sex. Like there's just so much that has been conflated, watered down, cherry picked, misinterpreted, um, and force fed to us as some kind of doctrine and dogma. And when I think about the word religion, which I talk about this in the book, religion comes from the Latin word ligare, which means to fasten or to bind. And we learned in elementary school, re means to do something again. So your religion should refasten you to God. Your religion should rebind you to God. So I argue that sin is separation from God. It's not a legalistic list of do's and don'ts. It's anything that makes me feel like I'm unworthy of being in relationship with my creator and or my ancestors, spirit guides, mm. universe, my energy. So <laughs> being able to come to that language even took a lot of work. They were telling me yoga is demonic. The first time I practiced yoga was at Yale Divinity School in chapel and a gay Brazilian yogi activist led a free class. And baby Fox, when I tell you at the end of that class, I felt strong and powerful and sexy and mighty and unfuckwittable. I was like, this is what they're scared of. They're scared of black women and femmes who are at home in their body and who feel sexy and regal. Cause a bad bitch who's comfortable in her body, regardless of complexion, size, dimples, rolls, fupa, whatever, is a problem to the system. Us hating ourselves keeps the system well oiled and running. Mm. You loving yourself puts a cog in the wheel of the matrix of systems of oppression. I didn't come to preach, but since I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> you are preaching right now. You are okay. preaching right now. You are, and this is oh, this yeah. is my favorite type of sermon. Love it. Um, and so, so actually, this kind of leads me to a, a question around preaching. So, you did you have uh was there a, por a portion or a part of your life where you were actually like preaching in church and doing the sermon thing? Like, okay, totally. okay. So, chapter five is called "Me Too Sis," right? Healing sexual trauma. Um, and fostering resiliency. And this is a content warning for childhood sexual abuse. So if you need to mute me for 30 seconds or come back to this recording later, you can do that. Um, my first assault was by my biological father. I was molested by my biological father for five years so from the ages of seven to 12. And so I was being abused by my dad at home, going to church and hearing about Father God. Father God is a protector, provider, caregiver. I was like, fathers are terrible, <laughs> actually. And so when I was getting my second master's degree at Columbia Theological Seminary, I was really interrogating how we could um, use poetry as a sacred text alongside the Bible to preach against childhood sexual abuse from the pulpit. Because when you look at the black church, it's two things that the, the Negro is gonna want. They gonna want to hear the choir sing good <laughs> and they gonna wanna hear a good message preached by the pastor or whoever. And so, listen, God gave me a lot of gifts and talents. Singing on key is not really one of them. I'm a still singer. Okay, I'm gonna make a joyful noise and joyful noise unto Audrey Lord. Okay, praise the Lord. So, but 
I could preach. I could preach my ass off. I won a preaching award from Yale. I was a preaching oh. darling. Oh, wow. I had the invitations, they were, hey, she's Yale educated. She uh, is a prophetic preacher, which means I have a focus on social justice. Like she is the golden child. It was all fun and games until I started talking about the shit on their row. You can talk about the presidential um, administration. You can talk about police brutality. You can talk about, you know, racism. But once you start talking about sexism in the church, ooh, once you start talking about inequities in the church, homophobia, queerphobia, transphobia, and me as a straight woman, <laughs> right? How dare you hold us accountable? So I noticed that theoretically, right? I was groomed, I was trained, I was um, 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 educated to be a critical thinker and to be a prophet and to speak about the things that I saw. But the powers that be didn't like that when it was about them. So coming to um, an understanding of power, of truth, I had to figure out how I can make black women and black girls the center of my ministry. And since there are no first person narratives of childhood sexual abuse in the Bible, I was like, that doesn't mean they didn't exist, <laughs> right? It just means we have to be um, more expansive with our thinking about what sacred texts are. So I argue that poetry is a sacred text, music, song lyrics, um, shoot, lines from a film or your favorite TV show, you know what I'm saying? Um, all of that work. So yeah, I, I, I eventually had to leave the black church for my own, um, wellness because once I started to realize that there were people who I considered comrades, even black women, right. Who were doing the work of liberation for black women. Once I realized that some of them were actually, not willing to buck against the system. I was like, I'm not about to be here fighting for the rest of my life. I'm trying to find my man. Okay. Get these eggs cracked. Okay. Travel. <laughs> <laughs> Rub one All out. The eggs cracked. Yes. Uh <laughs> Rambled, you know, okay. <laughs> I am not about to kill myself trying to yeah. find y'all. I'm not doing it. So I was like, you know what? Fuck your pulpit. I'm getting a podcast, right? Fuck your um, conferences. I'm getting published. I'm going straight to the source. And that's how we got here. That's awesome and very inspiring. I And I hate to be this person, but what's your sun sign, by the way? Yeah, like I'm a Leo sun, Pisces moon, Leo rising. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a Leo's Leo, babes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a cancer, Venus cancer. So it tracks. It tracks. Yes. Um, Fox, yes. can I look, can I read Natasha's question in the chat? Oh, uh, yes, please. Okay, it says, can you explain the mental, physical, and emotional aspect of healing from sexual trauma? What did it look like and how did you approach that process? Okay, Natasha, with this beautiful fro, for you and anyone else um, for whom this will resonate, I want to start by saying that um, I am so grateful that you are asking this question. Thank you. Um, I see you, <clears throat> I hear you, I acknowledge you, and I believe you. What happened to you was wrong and it was not your fault. There was nothing you could do to stop it or prevent it. If your belief system includes a higher power, they're pissed about it, okay? God is pissed about it, <laughs> your ancestors are pissed about it, and I'm pissed about it, point blank, period. And understanding that as a baseline of belief, um, there is something about owning your story and naming it for what it is yourself. So when I talk to uh, Black women and femmes, sometimes they don't even know that they have been assaulted, <laughs> right? Sometimes we minimize things. We, you know, as a coping mechanism to stay in our bodies, to stay grounded and present for mom and kids and school and work and blah, da 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 it's like, oh, well, he didn't do that. Or, you know, my homegirl went through this. It wasn't that bad. Like, it doesn't matter what, it, there's no, you know, hierarchy <laughs> of assault. Um, and so just naming it as such really helps you to stop um, running from, from it, the story and saying, this is what it is. 
um, journaling about it, saying it out loud, owning it, it takes the power away from it, the shame, just speaking it. When I say incest, people are like, oh. right? But I'm like, even you over there in the corner, like, this is your story, bitch. So <laughs> I love you and I'm going to be the one to say this word and know that it's going to happen because our trauma in the Black community is astronomical compared to non-Black people, right? Like national statistics say one in four girls and one in six boys before they turn 18 will be abused. Black Women's Blueprint in Brooklyn, they've been doing an ongoing study since 2011, and they have found that uh, seven out of 10 Black women, Black girls, excuse me, are abused before they turn 18. That's 70%. <laughs> like if 70% of black girls and women just up and got like, I don't know, uh, a pimple flu and we just had pimples all over our face and ears, we like, what y'all, right? But this is not something that's talked about. So I, I say that to say that this is, it's not your fault that you weren't given tools to face, name and identify the trauma. I want to let you know that what you're doing is revolutionary work. It's countercultural to ask this question about the mental, physical, and emotional aspects. So I'll start with the mental just by naming it what it was, which was father-daughter incest, not saying, well, he never did this and he only like, no, it was fucked up. It was wrong, right? Um, talk therapy has been very helpful for me. It took a minute to find the right therapist, but I've been with my therapist for five going on six five and a half years now um and I love her so much I quote her so much she wrote the forward to this book Doc, shout out to Dr. Brianna Boyd um and I did a lot of raging so it's for the physical aspect I can't tell you how many pillows I have beat <laughs> through against the wall how many boxing classes I've taken um how much wailing I've done. You know, in one part of the book, I talk about grief as a spiritual practice. Um, and so being able to conjure that energy and alchemize it, right, to transmute it, whether it's before you work out with your trainer or before you go for a jog or a run, um, if you are disabled or differently abled, whatever you can do in your body to expel energy. It could be shaking hands. It could be blinking your eyes real hard, whatever <laughs> you can do. Um, so that's been really important. Um, also, I talk about this in the book, uh, getting accustomed to my body and reclaiming it as my own. Um, for many of us, like there's shame about our bodies. We feel like we did something wrong. We don't want to entice the wrong person. Um, masturbation and self-pleasure and getting to know your body helps you to figure out what you like because masturbation is the most consensual sex you can have. Either you do it or you don't. And it helps you to figure out not just what your genitalia is saying to you, but what your nipples or behind your knees. I didn't know how to spot behind my knees, child, but I do, right? And I love it. Okay, <laughs> It feels great. Um, and so just reclaiming your body, knowing that you are good, healthy, um, holy, sacred, just as you are. And then the last part that I'll say is the emotional stuff. Um, is surrounding yourself with like-minded people who are on also on their healing journeys. Um, if you happen to be in a space where you can gather with other um, women who are overcoming, you know, their sexual trauma, it's always good to be in a space where you can say something and people already know what you mean. Um, and there's that that belonging really does go a long way. Um, obviously, reading books like mine, I've name dropped so many people in here. <laughs> there's so many books and resources and things. And um, yeah, and then the last thing that I'll say is because it's all interrelated, you know, you mentioned mental, physical, and emotional, but like the spiritual aspect of it, right? I was pissed. I was like, God, where were you? I'm like, how could you, you know, and my spiritual practice teaches me that God is with me with everything. So God is brokenhearted about the trauma that I've experienced as well and that you've experienced. Um, but being able to create a belief system that would even name that, right? Would even see me. I had to do that work myself because I didn't see it anywhere else. Um, so yeah, the last thing that I'll say is really pu pulling together a practice that feels good to you. As long as it's ethical, healthy, consensual, pleasurable, aligned, babes, you can do it. So for me, that looks like practicing yoga, 
burning ethically resourced sage and palo santo it means having an ancestral altar it means listening to smoky norfolk right <laughs> or uh what's that man name that i like chow hold on let me pull up my playlist it means listening to gospel music it means listening to beautiful chorus it means meditating it means journaling like literally anything that i want to do that feels good to me i'm going to do it because i need to be well and so Natasha, whatever you do with an intention is going to be a spiritual practice. And those are some of the things that have helped me and take what feels good to you, discover things that I didn't even mention, um, you know, and curate a spiritual cabinet of tools and resources and people that's helping you come to the other side. I hope that's helpful. I feel like it was very helpful for me and I didn't even ask the question. I love, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the breakdown and I love the details most mm -hmm. especially. And I think there's this thing of like, there's also an understanding and tell me if you disagree um, mm -hmm. that when it comes to this idea of like healing, it's not um, something that has an end to it. Right. You know, it's a, uh, a constant process and like what works for you what works for you what worked for you last year might not work this That's year good, so it's, good, it's good to that try good. good to try different things like while you're on your journey you know and once something starts to not feel like it's working it's okay to leave it alone mm -hmm. just like open up to new tactics yes I'm so glad you said that. Um, Tosh, I see your question, but Fox just sparked something in me. <laughs> so there was a point in time where just sharing my story made me feel powerful and whatever. You know, and there was a point in time where I would talk about it and I start crying. I have a question. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about that. Like, yeah, how did and it I start crying like immediately. Or, or I used to identify with it, like even dating. I'd be like, hi, my name is Levon. I was, you know, molested by my dad. And like, whoa, it's just too much trauma bonding. Like, <laughs> So now that I've healed that and I've integrated it, it's a part of me, but it doesn't define me. So now I'd be cracking jokes. It's very melancholy, very dark humor. And I mean that in a non-colonized way where I'd be cracking jokes. Be like, well, you know, my dad blessed me. So we here. And people are like, what? Are you? you are wild. I'm like, nah, it's just real. Right. So, um, talking about it used to bring me alive because I was like, I'm not hiding my secret anymore. And people are, you know what I'm saying? Open and honest and, and they're getting free too. Morning pages, which if you're unfamiliar, there's a book called The Artist Way that I love um, that basically tells you date yourself and keep your channel clear so you can create. That's the post-it, right? Too long, didn't read. But um, read it, it's really good. But she talks about like just writing stream of thought because a lot of times the great ideas under the gook Otherwise, we're like hmm, trying to be creative and sift through the noise. Like, no, just vomit onto the page and then get to the clarity. I used to love me some morning pages. I would even me morning too. page my horrorness and then burn it, right? To alchemize that energy. And somewhere along the way, y'all, like August, July, August 2023, the morning pages weren't weren't enough. But I was like, we need, we need something stronger. We need, come on, what other medicine we have? So out here in the DMV, there's a doctor. Her name is Dr. Magalie Brewer. She's of Haitian descent, uh, tra trained clinical psychologist, has her own practice and all of that. She also believes in using psilocybin, AKA mushrooms as mm. a healing antidote with her clients. So old girl slid into my DMs was like, hey, would love to have you be an influencer on this retreat in August. All you got to do is pay for your flight to get there. And I was like, God be praised. I'm, I'm in there. And I had ingested mushrooms twice before that, but this was my first therapeutic dose. Babes, the plant medicine, if anyone on this call or watching this recording is feeling called to plant medicine, answer the call. I'm just saying it it just opened my brain up because our brain is affected by trauma. Like the composition of our brain is affected by trauma. But if our brain can be affected by trauma, our brain can be affected by healing too and being rewired. Mm -hmm. Like it's science meets spirit, which they inform each other, whatever. So 
to your point, Fox, like there's going to come a point in your journey where like the things that you've been doing don't feel like they're working anymore. It just means, okay, you've up-leveled, you've ascended, it's time to go deeper, right? Because a lot of times we have these big traumas on the top and it's like, oh, I gotta heal this, I gotta integrate it. Like, child, have some fun too, right? Everything doesn't have to be, oh, what was me? I sure is healing now. Like, you know, <laughs> you get to have fun and um and and heal through that. So yeah, I, I just wanted to offer that. Period. Um, th there was a question that Quasi wrote. Um, she says, I really appreciate you sharing your personal experiences. This year I had an appointment with, with a Reiki master for my birthday gift to myself. Mm -hmm. During my appointment, I shared with her my experience of dealing with sexual harassment from family members and, and other children growing up. And after my appointment, I watched her on YouTube talking about my appointment what jesus um and her best friend chiming in on how people overshare mm. i don't like her i don't like this person i'm sorry I, um my question is how do you balance feeling safe vulnerable while yeah. sharing your story and seeking help so good i'm so sorry you had that experience Quasi. that's she violated your trust that was extremely unprofessional and also a violation of your trust. And as somebody who does Reiki, that's like you're supposed to be a healer. So there's like an expectation of confidentiality there. And I'm really sorry you had that experience. That was so un... Ooh. Okay. Bop, you said it. You said what I'm thinking. Bop, bop, Molly, bop. <laughs> but what you said is accurate. No, that is a huge violation of trust, a breach of confidentiality to the utmost degree. Um, and I'm so, so sad that happened to you. Um, yeah, her sharing your story without consent on a global platform is completely out of order. And we can bombard her page with one star reviews. Just drop the link. Okay. Um, <laughs> how do you balance feeling safe, vulnerable while sharing your story and or seeking help? So this is a major thing for black women and femmes in particular. Um, we have to be very discerning about who is worthy of us, right? I like to say that I find God in community and my community are people with whom I like to say, and I say this in the book, um, you know, with whom my, my soul can slouch. I don't have to put on, I don't have to provide, acquire, be, sh showcase, showboat. I can just be LaVon. Um, and so you have to discern who is worthy of that. So don't assume that every healer has your best interest at, at heart. Don't assume that every therapist is meant for you. The first therapist, mm, hold on. First therapist I saw was a graduate student when I was at Seton Hall University. And then I had my come to Jesus moment. I was like, girl, I don't need therapy no more because I got Jesus. And I was back looking for a therapist like two years later. So <laughs> I was like, that was cute. I'm angry still. Um, but the first therapist, I when I moved to the Bay Area to pastor, I found this woman, um, older Black woman, like blonde sister locks, Christian therapist. I was like, oh, she gonna be it. You know what I'm saying? I go to her office and I can't, can't even remember what I said, y'all. But I said something to her. She made a face like, mm. and I was like, you're not the one. You are not the two or the three. Like if any therapist makes a face when you say something, babes, thank you so much for your time. I believe this session has already been paid for. I got to go. Um, finding a therapist is like finding a great mate or the perfect pair of black pumps. Like you just got to, you got to try it out, child. <laughs> See how it go. In the moment you realize it don't go, don't stick to it. That's some black woman superhero um, Christianity suffer because that's what Christ did. Stuff like I just gotta make it work. No, you don't. <laughs> right? Get up out of there. Um, so that being said, being very um, tender with yourself. Right? Remind yourself you are a sacred, precious object. Okay. When you go into a jewelry store, they got a bunch of shit out, but the big ballers. The sacred stuff, the really valuable stuff, it's in the back in the vault, babes, right? So you got to keep yourself vaulted until people prove that they are safe and safe according to your definition, space for you, right? Listen to people. They tell you. 
Um, so the thing is, is that we want to be heard. We want to be seen. We go to healers. We expect X, Y, and Z. So a couple things. Um, speak to yourself, record voice memos, record um, videos. And like, I use a MacBook, so I have photo booth, but whatever your contraption has, hear, get used to hearing yourself talking about it. Because just hearing yourself playing it back, you are listening to you. You are validating you, right? Um, if there's someone in your life that you believe you can confide in and they have shown themselves to be supportive, then ask for permission to share with them. You know, if they can't, they can't. They they not a therapist. It's not their job. Um, but they can be a listening ear. Writing and journaling, writing and burning paper. Um, that helps. That helps me get used to sharing my story over and over again. Um, to the point where it just became something that happened to me, but it wasn't my identity. So the last part that I'll say is I am an anomaly. I, vulnerability is my superpower. Like it's nothing for me to share my business, obviously. So um, don't feel like you have to be like me either. Like you don't have to rush to share your story with everybody. If you feel led to, absolutely. But starting small, um, doing your work around these healers because healing is trendy now. It's a trend. Yes. It's a, it's like a commercial business. It's like yeah. just being mindful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you said that. I definitely have learned that part of, you know, a strategy and keeping myself safe is practicing discernment mm -hmm. and just recognizing that not every, you know, like they say, all kin folk, all skin folk and kin folk, yeah. like yeah. that, like discernment is such a critical part of life mm -hmm. that i definitely wish I had learned a lot earlier mm -hmm. you know uh when it comes to friendships choosing community choosing a spiritual space to be with folks like sh choosing to share and not share like I have been an overshare <laughs> mm -hmm. sure, and definitely felt like oh my god why did I just tell this person this so mm -hmm. I just like that you called that like brought that up there's such an important point I love that. And real quick, because I noticed somebody on this call who's like, I'm that person. Like, I don't know why people just tell me their life story. Like, girl, <laughs> invoice these people, right? Like, <laughs> it is not a bragging right to be like, I can hold space for everyone else and no one is holding space for you. Like, I'm not saying don't be chatty or kind or anything, but be mindful of who is holding space for you. It should be reciprocity. Who is engaging in the sacred act of reciprocity with you? Because this idea that Black women receive when they're young is that, you know, everybody and their mama come first. You got to take care of such and such. Blood is thicker than water. Family over everything. Like, family not over me. Relatives not over me. <laughs> like, I don't care that we have the same last name. Yeah. I'm going to do what I need to do for moi. Yeah, it's really, it really feels violent the way that like black girls are, are like just socialized to literally just forget and push their own needs and desire desires aside and like focus on everybody else. And I will say, especially the firstborn daughter, but just like girls in general, yeah. that just seems to be, we're just like socialized, like guided in that direction from a very young age. Mm -hmm. It feels violent. It is violent. And it, the violence continues because as you are on your spirit, actually, I want to close the loop on the previous thing. The last thing that I was going to say, um, Quasi, is that is that how you say it? Is it Quasi, Qua or Quay? It's Quasi. Quasi. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I, I saw you working. <laughs> I saw, I saw I saw you working to get there. Um, <laughs> you are on this call. This is your very first ecosystem, right? Ask Fox, like, hey, is it okay if we have a, if you start an email and don't be replying all, child. You know, I was gonna say group chat, but group chats be doing a lot these days. <laughs> but it's some way to keep in touch and ask each other about references. Do you know anyone? Do you, Is there someone you would ask who knows? Like we have to start, no, uh, honoring that everything that we need is already in the collective. Everything that we need is here. Somebody knows that I was going to this church in Berkeley. I met a woman at the church who's my soror. Uh, shout out to the Deltas. 
Hey y'all. And um, she started posting gems from her therapy sessions on Instagram stories. And I was like, girl, who is your therapist? She's like, oh, here's her number, blah, 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 blah. And now that's my therapist and the forward writer of my book, right? So ask <laughs> where it's safe to ask and watch the community build from there. Because community is another word that's being overused right now. A group of people is not community, right? A bunch of coworkers is not community. It requires time, intentionality, intimacy, vulnerability, all of that. So, hey, Sarah. So yeah, end of thought. But yeah, back to the violence part. When you show up in this new version of your healed self, there are people, relatives, friends, colleagues, whoever, who've known you for a long time who are gonna be pissed that you're healing. Because one, you're showing them that it's possible. They've been telling themselves a story all this time that this is just the way I are. This is just the way it is. You gotta forgive and forget, let go and let God bullshit, right? You face, you name, you identify, you heal, you transmute, you evolve. That's what you do when you really about that life. Um, and you're also going to realize like, there's just not room for that kind of dysfunction. It's like, I have to love you from afar or, you know, you living on dysfunction Island, baby. I'm not coming to that Island. I'm going to be out here rowing this boat in this water. If you would like to come meet me in the boat, you can come say what's up. And the moment you feel like you are homesick, go back to your dysfunctional Island <laughs> because that is violence too. Like people hating on your growth and your spiritual journey, um, which is why community chosen family, things like that are so important. You're muted, Bibs. Fox, you're muted. Oops. <laughs> um, definitely. And I, and I was saying for the folks who are on this call, if you're not in the free black women's library discord, please, mm. join, the, please join the discord. Perfect. It is very controlled, small space. There you go. Um, and I can create a discord thread specifically about central faith and all the different ideas connected to central faith. So Maybe we can drop like the different names um, from today's chat and from the book, other resources as far as like books and then maybe even resources for therapy or like different types of healing. Um, so I'm definitely down to do that. So please feel free to send me an email and I can add you to that discord. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to lift up this question from Tosh, yes. which says... Um, how did you detach from the idea of being chosen and waiting and all that stress to be in a relationship that looks godly on the outside when your marriage ended? All right. So I've been married once. And when I met this nigga, I was like, oh, he's like the female version of me. Like he loves pizza. He's involved in young adult ministry from LA. I'm from New York. I was like, oh, it's so cute. New York meets LA, whatever. Right. And there were some fuckboy tendencies that I overlooked because we just matched on paper so well, right? Like, I don't really like this her and power couple, but it was like, people were like, oh, she's a great preacher and pastor. And oh, he's a great prayer and like men's ministry leader. Like, they're a little more. But babe, like, I, he, we met October 20, y'all getting the whole timeline. <laughs> this is why you into a uh, free black women's, uh, this <laughs> October, when did I move to California? March 2015. So we met October 2015. He lived in LA like his whole life. He moved to the Bay January 2016. He proposed August 2016. We got married May 2017. By April 2018, I knew I made a mistake. October 2018, shit hit the fan. And our pastor was like, oh, I know a great couples counselor. Like she helped another couple. I didn't think they were going to bounce back. I'm pretty sure the nigga cheated. But um, we went to therapy and here's the kicker. She was like, my job is not to help y'all stay together. My job is to create space for you to talk to see if you want to be together. So I was like, okay. And I went on a yoga and manifestation retreat in Bali, December, 2018. And on that retreat, I was like, I'm going to fuck out this marriage. This is not it. I didn't feel supported. It was 50-50. Child, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, <laughs> uh, I was giving and investing all of my resources, financial, spiritual, social, emotional, otherwise, 
into a relationship that more or less was a glorified like fuck buddy situationship roommate situation um I changed my last name that last name was in Essence Magazine, November 2018. He never read the article that I was mentioned in. So that lack of support, even though it looked good on paper, what was going on behind the scenes was an absolute miss. And my intuition told me while we were dating that he was not the one for me. I'm like, oh, I'm 34. You know, he's well read. Like, we'll be good together. But child, chapter three. Hold on. What's the name of it, Fox? I had a feeling. Trusting your gut and nurturing your intuition. Babes, listen the first time. <laughs> and so even if you don't listen the first time or if you don't listen at all, if you ignore it, don't beat yourself up about, oh, I didn't listen to my intuition and this happened and da da da, da. Like honor that you heard right. And so for me, um, I was going through uh, a, a really rich unfolding to like marriage, monogamy one partner for the rest of your life right so like I explored cerebrally what it means to be not ethically not monogamous and polyamorous I've dated a couple polyamorous people um but I ultimately realized that like I'm consciously monogamous that's just a good fit for me right I respect everybody's thing to a, a, a right to be open and I honestly think more black women and femmes should be exploring ethical non-monogamy I, I think there are people who are not supposed to be married I think there are people who are not supposed to be parents I think right I think that and so it's a way to help me so for me I didn't feel chosen per se and there's a lot of pressure on women to be like the good wife and blah 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 I've been the one who's been like, um, excuse me, but what about, right? Because even when we were engaged, I was talking to some first ladies um, who were telling me about like marriage or their expression of marriage. And one time we were having a conversation sitting around this circle table and they were like, you know, you just, you have to be present for him and be there for him. And, you know, we talk about sex, all kinds of stuff, cooking, da, da, da. I was like, so hold on. Mm when how's he gonna be there for me and they thought I asked what is 62,000 times 482 minus the one carry the eight they were looking so confused so I've always been like um excuse me <laughs> what about right um so while I don't know your particular situation Tosh I can imagine that hearing story after story about being chosen and you know a godly man and this that and the third like it was a setup babes so once I realized that, I was like, the black church is 85% black women. And then we have to account for our queer brethren who ain't checking for women. Then we have to account for the fuck boys who just be quoting scripture to get ass. And we just, we not left with much. Okay. So that concept of looking for a godly man was completely misrepresented. And I'll close this part by saying that if you had an experience like I did, then Boaz was a major talking point for you, right? This character in the Bible who was like a provider. And there's this story about this older woman and her two daughter-in-laws, um, her sons, the husbands in these marriages died. And they're like, oh my God, how are we going to eat? So the mother-in-law tells one of the daughter-in-laws, listen, Boaz, after he ate and drank, go into his room, okay? And, and bow down at his feet, Okay. Now we were told, yes, go work in the field. And when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, your husband's going to see you and he's going to choose you and bless you and keep you. And blah. That's what we were sold. We were all looking for Boaz. Child, first of all, Boaz was 80 some years old. Okay. So that's very old, ashy, dusty peen, not being ageist, just saying. It's a penis that's been alive for a very long time. <laughs> right. Number two, feet is not what the mother-in-law said to go bow down before. It was actually penis. She told her daughter-in-law, go give this old man head so he will take care of us. We learned this in seminary. Pastors, black male pastors will literally say out of their mouths or their Twitter thumbs, yeah, I learned that, but I can't preach that in my church. So what is godly? <laughs> what is marriage even? These people weren't having weddings in the Bible, right? So... All that to say that you are allowed to express your sexuality on your own terms. God blessed you with the sacred gift of sexuality to express in ways that feel good to you. Dating 
is very interesting in a dance these days. Um, if you desire to be married, we're going to have to get creative. So I hope that answered the question. I feel like I said a whole lot, child. Does that help, Tosh? Thank you. Yes. I, okay. The story is not something I can get into on this call, but thank you. Yes. You okay. Cool beans. <laughs> The last part that I'll say is that I do talk about grieving in the book. I do talk about grieving the end of the marriage. Like it was the last time I was washing dishes in the apartment we were vacating and it just like came over me because I was realizing like the life that I had planned with this person, buying a house, watching him graduate from school. Like he had named our kids Caleb and Parker. Like I was grieving that life as his wife and mother. Um, so I don't want to act yeah. like oh, I just filed the divorce papers and I was cool. Um, but it was more about me choosing myself. I have an elder who says choosing yourself is choosing God. So choose God by choosing yourself. Ooh, I love that. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you answering. Thank you. You're worthy, my love. Choosing yourself is cho is choosing God is a bar that I am writing yes. down. Please do. Among, among the many other things I've written down that you said. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like the sacred gift of sexuality because absolutely like even in 2024 like sexuality and pleasure of women is something that's never like central it's never centered and it's definitely never categorized as sacred right sure. or even important <laughs> Yo, you know? yeah like you have women who are living their whole lives and never experiencing sexual uh -huh. pleasure which is so sad to me mm. oh yes um, The oh orgasm God. gap is real, especially for the straights. Okay. So Tasha says she bought you. I'm like, look, y'all, y'all don't think I want to step on your necks with another five foot ten glamazon? Like, just shut the internet down. But I like the men. So here we are. But um no, set get, okay, so here's the thing. I don't know everyone's pronouns on the call, but I'm speaking from my experience as a cishet black woman, right? We are the only creatures in all of creation to have a clitoris. That means not the duck, not the platypus, okay? Not the bumblebee, <laughs> not the gorilla. Nobody else has a clitoris. So that tells me that divine intelligence is in my body and includes my clitoris. And my clitoris has one job, one. And it's not to defecate, urinate, birth, regurgitate, it is for me to come. It is for me to orgasm. It is for me to climax. And so while I don't have a scripture that says the clitoris is holy brethren, right? Like <laughs> when I put on my thinking cap that spirit gave me and I look at science and I what I know about God, right? When we say theology, it means God talk, quoting um, Dolores Williams. When I say... Um, that it's a sacred gift, I'm saying that I believe we're expressions of God. <laughs> and so if I'm holy, my body is holy, my clitoris is a part of my body, therefore my clitoris is holy. Babes, they don't want you fucking for yourself. Okay, they want you fucking to procreate. <laughs> they want more babies for their churches and their belief systems. Orgasm does nothing for patriarchy. In fact, orgasm destroys patriarchy <laughs> because the clarity okay the creativity okay the bad bitchness it's 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 it's, it's amplified after a good bust okay and so the roles <laughs> is in, <laughs> all right the 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 rabbits the butterflies whatever your shape is chow <laughs> um it it is yours and it it really does help um you embody agency and um, um, power and pleasure. And that is countercultural. It's countercultural for a woman to own and embrace her sexuality, right? It's why we have things called like the slut walk and, you know, um, oh, she's a whore, she's a this. Like, we don't slut shame over here. Slut is not a bad word <laughs> over here. Uh, as long as everything is healthy, consensual, ethical, pleasurable, you not hurt nobody, do you and him and her and them right <laughs> at the same time whatever so the last <laughs> thing that i say is i orgasm during meditation so i know what you mean the clarity right 
is that I'll say for my yogi girls, you know, we talk about chakras, right? And in the West, we talk about seven, but there are at least 114. So that just goes to show. <laughs> you may call her a hoe, but she calls herself immortal. I know that's right. Um, the sacral chakra, right? That's in the womb area, the uterus space, um, that is our pleasure center for sensuality and sexuality. But, <clears throat> excuse me, or also, and it's where our creativity resides, our ideas. Um, you know, when we talk about divine feminine energy, it's not wearing pink and speaking softly and putting on dresses and makeup. Like, that's fine. Do all that. But divine feminine energy is more about being creative and intuitive and in flow and all of that comes from your sacral chakra. So healing your sexual trauma is crucial for having a healthy sacral chakra because if you feel like any part of your body is bad or evil or damaged or you know, otherwise just not holy or sacred, um, it's gonna be blocked and it's gonna feel sterile. It's gonna feel um, lifeless. But when you can breathe into that and own that, yeah, masturbation is a gift from God. Like- Pleasure is my birthright. Pleasure, I believe for Black women and femmes, pleasure is the pathway to liberation. Mm. Like, that that changes how you approach your body. It changes how you talk about your body. Dancing naked in the mirror is sorcery. <laughs> Looking at yourself and knowing that you belong to you and it doesn't matter what anyone else did to you or harmed you, you are sovereign. That goes a long way in your liberation journey. Mm. I love that so much. You dropping bars, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, boo. And you said you're a rapper. Yeah, you're a rapper. Can you imagine like a hip hop album? Hey, turn my mic up. Like, that's like kind of going into exploring all these different themes. That would be, that would be dope. Okay, speaking Fox. That would be dope. That would be so dope. Um. I'm going to pivot a little bit because I'm kind of sure. curious about this. Sure. Like, can you talk a little bit about like womanism um, yeah. and like, as far as like a personal politic, would mm -hmm. you say that womanism is contrary to black feminism? Is that yeah, something, are those ideas that you kind of tease out and do you identify as a womanist? Okay. Um, let us know a little bit about that if you yeah can. so i have historically identified with womanism um it feels like a good fit for me uh i'm always expanding so who knows what i'll identify as later pero um woman is came out in 1979 alice walker mm -hmm. and then in search of our mother's gardens 83 she put in this beautiful four-part uh definition which i have included minus like I think like four words because it was a copyright issue, <laughs> but I was like, we got to put that whole definition in here. Um, and the third one says womanism is to feminism as purple is to lavender. And what it makes me think of is how black women just have a deeper shade of life, right? We're living at the intersection of race and gender and class and status and, 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 um, and so it just goes to show that Black women's experiences require more depth, right? And I have read Black feminists. That I have been in community with Black feminists. I respect several Black feminists. I would never personally identify as a feminist, though, because wasn't nothing about feminism created with me in mind. <laughs> Womanism was created with Black women in mind. And so in the early 20th century, when in white women were the suffragettes were marching for the right to vote, they were not voting for us. I mean, they were not marching for us to vote. <laughs> too. So it just doesn't serve me. Womanism feels like home because I am a Black woman. Um, I love being a Black woman and I love Black women non-sexually. Um, except Megan Thee Stallion. Sometimes she make be making me question. <laughs> Megan, Megan Pete will make me question my sexuality. She's just so fine. But um, I, I, I was trained by womanists in college, uh, in grad school, in seminary. Um, and it became a pathway for me. Um, womanism centers the experiences, perspectives, and vantage points of Black women. And I just loved that 
we got to be creative. We got to be bold. We got to be sensual, sexual, all of that. So yes, this book is womanist. I have historically been womanist. I had a Malcolm X experience where towards the end of his life, Malcolm X was like, you know, maybe not every white person is a white devil, <laughs> right? I've had experiences where I'm like, you know what? There are some gay black men who sister me more than some black women I've come into contact with. There are some non-black people who have sistered me more tenderly, right? And mm -hmm. so identifying with a, a title doesn't really feel like a good fit anymore, especially post mushroom journey. <laughs> yes. But it's the school of thought that most closely resonates what feels good to me. Because if I'm honest, I would want like an Afro-Caribbean American framework. Mm. Yeah. But that's just LeVon Briggs. That's the LeVon Briggs framework, right? So I feel like womanist is a really beautiful term that, in that captures like Black women's thought. I also feel like it's also limiting. It doesn't encapsulate everything that it means to being a Black woman. Being a Black woman is not a monolith. So we can't have one framework for every Black woman in femme. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's empowering, but also like, what word are you making up? What is English is a colonized tongue. So we trying to figure it out in the colonizer's language anyway. What, what um, hum feels good to you, right? What moan or groan feels good to you? What, what arm swing or butt twerk like it's more than just this tongue so yes and yeah yeah I I appreciate that I appreciate that um and then I also have a question um as far as like are there like let's say that the publishers of this book came to you and wanted to talk about doing like a second edition, right? Because like I'm in this library, there are over 5,000 books here. And sometimes within the second edition, there's a shift or a change or an additional chapter mm -hmm. or something that's been kind of like pulled out. Like, do you, is there anything else that you feel like you would want to include in like the second edition of Central Faith? Or is there yeah. a part that you would want to like, just give us more of that you feel like wasn't mm -hmm. illuminated in the that's way. Really, that's a really good question, Fox. Um, I feel like sensual faith did what it needed to do. Like the book was done before I even got my deal. And for those of you who are authors, you know, um, as well, like you can never be done with a manuscript <laughs> if you like, just keep sitting with it like it just had to be done like even as I was recording the audiobook if you're an audio person I read the audiobook so it's happened there but um I was reading stuff and I was like oh I want to change that word you can't bitch it's published it's done <laughs> right so I feel like just leaving it where it is would be great um I am writing book number two which we can call sensual faith the second edition um, it's tentatively titled Unruly Women, How Liberated Baddies Are Going to Heal the World. And I'm talking about what it means to be a Black woman who is sovereign and has created a spiritual belief system that centers her pleasure. And so I would want to talk about plant medicine. I would want to talk about kink and BDSM. I would want, it's kind of like if sensual faith is the 101, I want to go to like sensual faith 401. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's get into it. And how do we integrate these thoughts and practices and principles into our spiritual, you know, system? I love that. I love that. And I must admit that in reading this book, it really... Hmm. kind of forced me to confront some of my own ideas about mm -hmm. religion and the church mm -hmm. it it helped me to look at the bible differently and like the stories in the bible uh so i appreciate all the research that you did around <laughs> that and like all the back like is there's like the bible stories and then there's the back stories 
Mm-hmm. And she gave, and I'm like, oh, the Bible is kind of a scandalous text. The Bible is tea, bro. I always say you don't need soap operas. Just go read the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Just go. Drama. Like, whoa. Um, <laughs> but is there anyone who else who had a question? Because I feel like I've asked all mine. Those are fabulous questions, Fox. Thank you so much. Thank you for answering them. <laughs> Oh, somebody's in the, at the door. Um, okay, so I guess it's just on me then. I'll ask I'll ask my next question, which is so whew, I'm curious about, and this might be getting too much in your business. Oh, go for it. Um the well, the stuff you shared around your uh around your the incessant abuse was that something that you had chatted with? Oh, somebody named Levon Briggs is requesting to record this meeting. Oh, that's weird. Mm-mm, don't do that. Okay, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's odd. Um, how did people? How well, not how did people? How did your mom mm-hmm. respond to you sharing that? Was or did you warn her in advance about that? So I had been sharing that publicly for years. Okay. Um, at one point in time, I was like Facebook friends with some of her coworkers. And I posted something, it was like um, a a very early podcast episode that I did with this first lady who was doing like church stories, black women, da, da, da. So I posted it and I guess, not I guess, I know the coworkers saw it. So they went up to my mom and they were like, is it true? My mom was like, is what true? And like, did LaVon's dad abuse her? And so she didn't tell me what she said, but of course she brought her anger to me because I'm the child. It's easy to take it out on me and not the nigga who did it. But um, she was like, you know, remove them as your Facebook friends if you're going to be talking about all this other kind of stuff. So, you know, my mom had, I don't think, I don't know if she does anymore, but if she still feels guilty, it's not my problem. I've already told her twice that I don't blame her for it. It's not my job to hold her guilt or shame or rage or grief or whatever. Um, so I actually talked a lot with my therapist about this in the, you know, weeks before the book came out. I'm like, what, 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 what is going to happen? She's like, the world might blame your mother because it's easy to blame the mother. (laughs) It's easy to blame, uh, where were you? Right. And we put so much pressure on women and mothers in particular. Um, but I just wanted to share the truth in a way where it was like, you know, this is happening. Um, but I wasn't gratuitous. Like when you read the book, I don't go into details about a particular incident. I mentioned a conversation, you know, there was a request. I denied it. We pushed it on, but even just mentioning childhood sexual abuse or incest or father could be, you know, activating for some people. So there is a content warning at the top of that chapter to let you know where to go. If you'd rather not read that part, but no, it's not gratuitous or graphic. Um, so yeah, it, has always been a thing where once I was probably like 16 that I started to tell people I told my best friend in high school and then when I was 19 I told a boyfriend and just the closer and closer it got to my family they were just like not sure how to deal with it right and then I realized that this happened to other people in my family Mm -hmm. um parents grandparents aunties cousins like and I was like we all just sitting here traumatized don't nobody want to talk about this shit I was like y'all are wilding so that's why I just you know shifted away from my relatives and I started to create my own family systems um that's going to be really important in your healing journey too once you really start talking about stuff openly and really dealing with it and processing it there are going to be some people that just aren't prepared for it and you have to make sure that you're surrounded by people who love you and love you well and the beautiful thing is y'all you know as we get ready to close this call like you have not met everyone who's going to love you and love you well yet don't believe that no one's going to love you at the end of all of this there are people who cannot wait to hold you hold space for you and love you that Um, is so beautiful 
Yeah. How's your relationship with your dad now? We don't speak. You know, uh, we spoke the day Lemonade came out, if you can believe that timing. And I asked him if he was abused as a child and he shared something with me that I was like, wow, this shit goes deep. But um, yeah, I, I hope he's well. You know, I understand. I have forgiven him. Um, but that doesn't mean that I have to be in relationship with him. Period. Yeah, period. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I have one last question, which is more of, a, I guess, a maybe a business style question. And that's for people who are writers who are interested in writing and looking to be published and things yes. like that. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit about like the process of getting your work published and maybe mm -hmm. offering some insight or totally. yeah. So um, I actually have an offering called uh, the It Is Finished Book Proposal Challenge, which is a three night challenge. And you'll have a one page book proposal done. That's for folks who want to get the book idea out of their head and onto the page. Um, there's also a book proposal incubator. That one is 30 days and like the same 35 page book proposal that I put together, you will have because um, published authors editors like they were sending me resources I was just meeting people at speaking engagements or like you know through colleagues and so I've just basically put together this little packet for you to be like here fill out this template and this will get it done because a lot of it is just in your brain and you just need to know how to put it on the page and present it to people because the publishing industry traditionally is still very much white people ask me about self-publishing I'm like I don't know nothing about that you're gonna have to go to YouTube University but if you're interested in traditional publishing, you do need your book proposal. You do not need a completed manuscript. A lot of people think they need the book to be completely done before they get a deal. You don't. Um, you don't need an agent to get a book deal, but it is helpful to have one just because they know the ins and outs of the industry and they can um, negotiate better on your behalf. Um, the last thing that I'll say is a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I'm gonna write this book and I'm gonna sell 20 million copies and I'm gonna make all this money. Um, for most people, and this was true for me, like the book isn't what makes you a millionaire. It's the after effects, the people who read it and they bring you on and they wanna create this and do that and da da da. So if you're writing to get rich, babe, just start on OnlyFans. I, Cause <laughs> unless spirit is very clear and like, when you write this book, you will sell 50 gazillion copies, right? Like. For the, for the really like the book came out and it came out like I had a celebration I did a dinner with close friends and then had like a big launch party but like for the most part like I'm still talking I'm still chatting I'm still writing I'm still creating um but you know we claim in that 20 million dollars BB so we could do this work with all these black women um but yeah those are some of the tips that I would say uh you don't have your book man have your book proposal done you don't need a full book manuscript um an agent is helpful, not necessary, but very, very helpful. And um, know that the money is cute if you get a traditional deal, um, but it's also given out in installments, not a lump sum. <laughs> so and did you and did you have to deal with any? Um, did you have to deal? Did you have any issues with your with your editors or with the publisher as far as them trying to like? Yeah, there were two things that came up. In the book, I say something and then I write out like Eba Shondo. You know how we be playing, speaking in tongues or whatever. And um, yeah, one of the editors, a, black, a white man was like, are enough people going to know what this means to include it? And I was like, trust me, the people who know what it means, they're going to know. We're keeping it. Um, and I did have an uh, all white team except for one black woman shout out to Portia Burke who was the last person to edit Dr. Maya Angelou's work so I was like if she's good enough for Dr. Angelou she's good enough for me um but she was the black woman editor on that team who was like translating and stuff like that um there did come a point where they had to soothe me <laughs> and tell me that they were the right people for me because they were concerned that I was talking about hoodoo during this is when I was pastoring the proverbial experience, my digital congregation on Instagram. And they were like, um, this hoodoo. I was like, or like this voodoo. I was like, first of all, I don't practice voodoo. I don't know nothing about voodoo. I don't touch voodoo because that's not my people. Now, if you mean hoodoo, right? So we had to have a conversation about what happens when you center voices that have been historically marginalized. You cannot 
have somebody who's been historically marginalized come to the center and say, well, don't do it like that, do it like this. I was like, so either I'm going to do it the way it needs to be done, or I'm not going to do it with y'all. And they were like, oh, we get it. We support you. Thank you so much. I was like, okay, we had to gather them real quick. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I It's so important to like trust your own voice and believe in your own voice as a writer because oftentimes <clears throat> uh, I hear this story from so many uh, Black women writers that come to Reading Club who sometimes get into this, they have these moments of tension with their publisher and with their editors where they have to really advocate for themselves and advocate for the voice and like telling the story how they want to tell it and not right. being um censored or yep. trying to like change you yep. know the language or like you said like oh maybe you need to explain this yeah. so whoever's reading it can understand what you mean and it's like no my audience will know exactly what I'm talking about so I don't need yeah. to explain exactly. so that's happened to some writers I know I had a friend who was writing YA and the editor was like can you make this a little bit more street? Can you add a little more grit? Make was, it more hood, more Negro. Right. <laughs> and she was <laughs> like, mm, it, no. it's about two Black kids who fall in love, who live in the Bronx. It's fine the way it is. So. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, sometimes they get pushed. And I really yeah. want writers to hear that you can just walk away from a deal. Right? Yeah. And, you can if you sold it once, you can sell it again. That's the beauty yeah. of it. And um, exactly. I do spiritual life coaching. I do book coaching slash doula ing. So if that's something that you're interested in, definitely send me a note or DM and we can talk about that. Um, but I wanted to close with Nissa's question, which is what is your simple daily prayer? Every morning I wake up and I say, thank you, God, which is great gratitude for life. I hug myself and I say, welcome back, LaVon, because I went somewhere while I was asleep, whether it was a dream or something. I just want to, you, you in the flesh, child, we back. And today is the best day ever. And if you say that every day, life just keeps getting better and better. That's so beautiful. Thank you, Nisa, for that awesome question. Woo, this has been like church. Like it's Sunday. We went to church on a Sunday. Okay. And I've only had one black woman. I've only experienced one black woman preacher in my life. Wow. I really want more of that because I feel like there's something so empowering for me to see a black woman like wielding a spiritual word. Mm. Well, go back. The, the archives are there, child. The proverbial experience on Instagram, tons and tons of messages, sermons, tarot and oracle card pulls, readings, all of that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, LaVon. For Perfect, thank you for here. inviting me. Thank you for writing this awesome book with the affirmations and the prompts. I love an interactive book, child. I'm like, yes, please give me some work to do. Let me embody this work. Here it is. Um, thank you for that. Um, and just being with us and being so open and honest with everything that you've experienced because mm -hmm. it makes a difference. You're worthy, my dear. So we have talked about some um, tender things. Is it okay if I pray for us to close us out? Oh, yes, I love that. All right. So I invite you to take a deep cleansing breath wherever you are. Big inhale in. Hold it and exhale out. <sighs> feel comfortable, you can close your eyes or soften your gaze if it is safe for you to do so. Gracious and eternal creator, thank you so much for the beautiful gift of this day, this evening. Thank you for allowing us to gather in community. Community is so precious and so sacred. It is a currency. It is a superpower. And we do not take it for granted that we were able to be here. So we thank you for Wi-Fi. We thank you for Zoom. We thank you for Instagram. We thank you for Fox. We thank you for um, subscriptions and memberships and um, callings. Uh, we thank you for the gift of discernment that compelled us to be here grouped and gathered and speaking. Um, I'm so grateful for this invitation. I thank you for um, choosing me as the channel for sensual faith. And I just pray that it continues to reach whoever it needs to reach in order to bear good fruit and expand the collective. I pray for the deep, holistic, um, 
totalitarian embodied enveloped fully engrossed healing of every being on this call i pray for every household that is here for every lineage that is represented here um, i pray that if any tender spots have been agitated throughout this conversation that you would soothe them with your loving bond i pray that my mother oshun will send the fresh waters and the sweetness of the honey of life and sacred um knowing and ritual and care to touch the crown of everyone represented here and everyone on this call. Um, I just thank you for the healing that is to come for the evolution. I pray for purpose and resources and nourishment and love and joy and peace and abundance and ease and flow um, in just magnificent quantities that it will be bestowed upon everyone um, who's listening to this prayer. So thank you. We pray for a sweet transition. We pray for peaceful, restorative rest tonight. And um, we bless Fox and her leadership. Pray that you will continue to strengthen her, guide her, um, enlarge and expand her vision, her capacity, her reach with physical, mental, spiritual, financial resources. Um, and we are just so, so grateful for the opportunity to be a part of it all. And I ask all these blessings in the name of everything that is love and light and holy, Ashe and amen. A. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> that's my tambourine that's it thank you so much Levon. um i'm definitely going to i'm so glad i recorded this um for everyone who's on this call thank you for being here and sharing this energy with me i hope you'll join me again at the free black women's library reading cup for the next discussion if you're ever in Brooklyn, please come to the space. <laughs> uh, please come and spend time with us. Come and write yes. with us. Come and read with us. Come and pray and like yes. find, find spirituality with us. Uh, you're always welcome. You. And I want to wish everyone a beautiful, blessed night. Um, you, you are a gem. You're, you're a gem. I appreciate your work. Um, and I'm just... I don't know. I feel, I feel good. I feel good. <laughs> good. I'm glad. I always say go in peace, go in power, go in pleasure, be well, beloved ones. And if it's not well, it's not the end. And remember, faith should feel good. So that's it. That's all. <laughs> good night, y'all. Thank you. Thank you for being available. Yes. Thank You're you. Worthy. worthy. Thank you so much. You're worthy. <laughs> Yes. yes, queens. Mm, mm, mm. Outstanding. I'm going to stop recording.